Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming. This is the Local History, Local Novelist series. I'm Susan Stinson, I'm the writer in residence at Forbes. And tonight, um, the reading that we have is called Three Houses. I'm very excited about it. Um, the series runs from um, October to May, so there are um, two more and it's monthly. Um, next month, it's gonna be on April 10th. Usually it's the first Wednesday in the month. Next month, it's the only month where it's the second Wednesday in the month. And that reading's gonna be Jewish Writers, History, and New England with Rich Michelson, Michael Hoberman, and Jane Yolen. So that's gonna be really fabulous. And then um, on May 1st, it's a celebration of local novelists with Marianne Banks, Michelle Barker, Suzanne strippick Shea and Karen V. Williams, whose book, um, My Enemy's Tears, The Witch of Northampton, about um, Goody Parsons, um, just won a, I think it's a Massachusetts Book Award, so that's gonna be really fun. Um, and I've got flyers for the series, if you haven't got them and you want them, um, they'll be on the glass case after the reading. Um, right now they're on my chair. And you can also find the schedule at the, on the website of, of Forbes Library. So, tonight though, um, what, who, what we have is, is um, three wonderful, very different writers um, talking about um, three very specific houses. Um, and I don't think I'm gonna say anything else about that. Um, I'm just gonna see what happens. So I'll introduce them one by one and see what happens. It's Luz Stone, Sylvia Gover, and Lei T. Yim Tui. Um, so, and we're starting with Lou. So Lou Stone is a Northampton writer and editor who worked for nearly 40 years in the advertising, public relations, and marketing businesses, chiefly with colleges, universities, and independent schools. Winner of numerous awards from the Council for Advancement and Supportive Education for her publications, she has been a workshop presenter and speaker at schools and conferences. In 1987, she set up her own freelance business, Loose Stone Publications, and she is presently writing a sequel to her chapbook, A House, A Street, A City, The Story of 17th Summer. Um, and the sequel will focus on the early history of her North Street, Northampton neighborhood. And the story of 17th Summer is a fine, carefully researched tribute to cottages of 19th century vernacular design, French porch sitting, and a neighborhood that reflects our city. Lou Stone. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for all coming out from your houses tonight. I'm going to read um, the introduction to the book, which will explain what the book is all about. The stories of the 10 individuals and families who own some 17 Summer Street over the 130 years. And also it talks about the times they lived in and how the city changed. From there I'm going to talk about a significant character in the book, Lewis Warner who was the developer who bought two acres off King Street, uh, the north side of Summer, and what would become Myrtle Street, and uh, put in a subdivision in the early 1870s and built seven or eight cottages, and one of which was 17 Summer Street. And when you do research, you never know what you'll expect. And there was a lot I didn't expect with Lewis Warner. And this is about the last chapter of his story of 17 Summer. So the introduction I'll start with, City Lot. Patent medicine bottles in turquoise glass inkwells. A baker's best cocoa tin. Canning jars with rusty wire rims. A burnt scrap of, of a letter mentioning Charlie, 1886. The story of 17 Summer begins in fragments, 
the flotsam of lives tossed beneath floors, behind walls, in gardens, and exposed in fits of modern improvement. Neighbors enhance the tale. They tell us an Olympic swimmer lived here. We hear about the owner who kept pigeons in the garage and a neighbor's brother who lived, rented the place in the 50s. Some say our house was part of a development built for railroad workers in the 1870s. When we walk around the neighborhood, we notice a group of houses that are 17 summers clones. We feel an instant kinship with people living in our domestic counterparts and share a curiosity of how our 19th century Levittown was born. What was the neighborhood like back then? Were our houses really intended for railroad workers? Whom can we credit for building our sturdy little cottages that have weathered more than 130 New England winters? After scraping off wallpaper in the dining room, we discover a man's signature, crayoned on plaster, dated 1905. One summer evening, a young woman knocks on our kitchen door and asks to see the house. She once lived here, too. Who were the people who looked out my office windows whose panes still display irregular bubbles, rocked on the front porch, planted the rhododendron and peonies, wore down the pine stair treads, washed clothes in the cast iron tub in the cellar, raised children and went off to work each morning. Where did they come from? What turns in their lives brought them to Summer Street? Did they love the house as much as we? This is the story of one house and one neighborhood in the city of Northampton, neither ever claimed any heirs or mentions in books. Wherever they are, ordinary places hold stories worth telling. Now we'll go on to Lewis Warner, who was a very prominent man, banker in town. He had his finger in everything about town, very prominent. Gone. Two friends from the Northampton Club saw him and his son that April morning driving down Hawley at a breakneck speed. Later, the talk on Main Street was the two were headed to Canada. The station agent in Westfield, a former resident of Northampton, spotted him waiting impatiently for the 229 train. When his son returned home around 8 o'clock, the horses were said to be white with foam and showing signs of a fast and long drive. On that infamous day, April 30, 1898, the Gazette put out four editions, selling copies like thunder to a community stunned by news no one could or wanted to believe. Their beloved bank president, Lewis Warner, had been caught embezzling money from his banks, and a warrant had been issued by the U.S. Marshals for his arrest. Lou Warner's nervousness, noticed by so many over the years, now had a cause. His ardent lobbying against the state legislature's proposal to separate the operations of National and Savings Bank now had a reason. Beneath the banner headline, Bank President Gone, the Gazette reported that Warner had fled town soon after realizing the bank examiners were about to expose his fraud. For decades, Warner had written false checks and certificates of deposit and maneuvered them between the two banks to show assets did not exist. The Gazette tried to make sense of the shocking news. No man in Northampton ever made more friends, the paper stated in its front page story. No man ever did kind deeds than Lewis Warner. He helped everyone who applied to him. The Springfield Union minced no words, calling its native son a reproach to his adopted city, 
a liberal spender of other people's money. He was popular in other people's expense. He ran a political machine on other people's capital. In an unsigned statement left on the top of the roll top desk in the bank office the night before fleeing, Warner gave a disjointed and sketchy account of his peculations. As excuse for 30 years of wrongdoing, the Gazette icily reported, he cites the heavy losses which he incurred at the old button shop, the porter works, and the bicycle factory. Warner also credited his, his downfall to his disastrous dealings with bucket shops a shady brokerage operation that drew its name from bucket shops, saloons that sold small quantities of liquor in buckets to the poor. Later that month, the grand jury swore out an indictment on Warner for 12 counts of embezzlement, and his trial was scheduled for the next criminal session of Superior Court in December. If any of his old cronies or business associates or family members knew of Lou Warner's whereabouts, no one was telling. Amazing story. In late July of 1898, James Porter, a traveling salesman from Hatfield, was standing on a corner in downtown Louisville, Kentucky, when he spotted a man he recognized. Across the street was a business associate of his half-brother, John Porter, Lewis Warner. Realizing he had been recognized, Warner quickly darted into a fruit store. He was arrested three days later, and Chief Henry Maynard and Chef Jarius Clark were soon on a train to Louisville to pick up the fugitive and bring him back to Northampton. Confident that Porter would not turn him in, Warner had stayed in Louisville following his usual rounds and mingling with his kind in fashionable neighborhoods, as the Gazette would later report. For three months, Frank Williams, as he was known, had worked his way into the city's elite, hobnobbing with business leaders and the fire chief, advising a candidate running for the U.S. Congress. Although nearly penniless when arrested, he was the same jovial, nonchalant Lou Warner, never showing a bit of remorse. A public eager to see their city's most notorious citizen line Main Street the morning of August 27 when Lewis Warner was brought over from the jail to the courthouse to answer to the charge of embezzlement. Despite the angry sentiments of the crowd, there were no sensational scenes, according to the Gazette. A cool, impressive, debonair, and well-dressed Warner, his attorney, William Brooks of Holyoke, by his side, pleaded not guilty and was remanded to custody without bail. Speechless. A week or so before the trial, District Attorney Hammond began to hear the talk going around Union Street Jail. Lewis Warner was acting strange. At the DA's request, Dr. Edward Beecher Nims, the former superintendent of the Northampton Lunatic Hospital, came up from his home in Springfield to make a thorough examination of Warner in his cell. Afterwards, he and, and jailhouse physician Dr. George Thaler held a consultation with Dr. William Trow, a local physician. Their opinions regarding Warner's mental and physical state were not made known. According to his attorney, Lewis Warner was too ill to be caught on the opening day of his trial, December 27th. Was he really ill or in the words of the Gazette, shamming? That was the question buzzing around the packed courtroom when attorney Brooks jumped up and stated that he intended to file a motion for continuation of the trial on the ground that Mr. Warner was not physically and mentally able to attend the trial and make a defense. And he had witnesses to show it. Warner's sister Marie was the first to take the stand, testifying that her brother had become non-communicative 
and indifferent to his dress in jail and exhibited a disturbed state of mind. Mabel Metcalf, Warner's daughter, spoke of her father's bouts with vertigo at home. And David Skates, Warner's former right-hand man at the jail, described a confused and prostrate defendant during his last visit. The defense brought in an out-of-town out team of insanity experts, the superintendent of prestigious McLean Hospital among them. When the trial resumed the morning, well, he went to trial, and then when the trial <coughs> resumed, the jury found him guilty. And he was sentenced to no less than nine days, nine years in jail. They had dragged him tottering up the stairs into, um, into the, uh, the uh, court. On a routine visit to Charlestown State Prison in late September of 1899, Sheriff Clark and Assistant Turnkey Dickinson stopped in to see Lewis Warner. Later, they reported to the Gazette that the prisoner was the same old self. He was cheerful in excellent health, and much to the officer's astonishment, talked as glibly as he ever did in his palmiest days. So I thank Lewis Warner for building my house, 17 <laughs> Summer Street. <laughs> Be sure to mention that um, copies of the book are going to be available to, for sale out in just outside the door. I want to thank Steve Strymer from Levelers Press for taking, helping with the sales. We appreciate that. And they're wonderful books, so consider that. Next we have Sivia Gover. Um, Sivia is the author of Learning in Mrs. Town's House from Levelers Press and Mindful Moments for Stressful Days. Her articles and essays have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Creative Nonfiction, and the Christian Science Monitor. In addition, she has been published in over a dozen anthologies. Gover received her MFA in Creative Nonfiction from Columbia University. She continues to teach and learn with her students in Mrs. Town's House, also known as the Care Center in Holyoke. And Learning in Mrs. Ha Town's House is a funny, thoughtful, honest book, and it's full of discoveries. It's a great pleasure to have Sivia here tonight. It is a pleasure to be here. So Learning in Mrs. Town's House is, in a sense, three different stories in one book. It's a story, the contemporary story, of teen moms who come to the care center in Holyoke at 247 Cabot to learn and study for their GED exam. Um, and it's also the story of Mrs. Elizabeth Town, who um, lived at 247 Cabot Street from 1900 until her death in um, 1960. Actually, 1906, I'm not breaking with dates. She was born in 1865. She was the daughter of pioneers. So it's her story. And it's my story. It's my memoir. Um, it's a memoir of an idealistic, white, liberal Jewish woman who came to 247 Cabot Street to do good and change the world by teaching T Mom's poetry. <laughs> And what joins all these three stories together is literally the house itself. So the house at 247 Cabot Street not only held the stories between its walls, but it also helped to create the stories. For Mrs. Town, this house, which was built in 1898, um, and again, she moved in in 1906, this house represented to her progress, optimism, and change. She was constantly updating it. She was constantly improving it. And today, the house is still a place of optimism. It's still a place where um, young women get a second chance. 
So that optimism is core to the place today. It really, it's called the care center. It's truly a caring place where young women who society have given up on can learn again and grow again. So what I want to do right now is read you an excerpt from the book. And then I'll come back and show you some more pictures from the house and uh, show you a little bit about how the story can frame itself. The book takes place um, in the early 2000s. I started teaching at the care center almost exactly 13 years ago today. It was March 1st, I believe, that I first entered the house. And um, when I first entered the house, um, I came very idealistically saying I'd like to teach poetry to teen moms. And for some strange reason, the director of education said, OK. <laughs> but she was smart enough not to just throw me in the classroom um, with these teen moms right away. She suggested I come in and observe. So I'm going to read you a little section from my very first day in the house and the odd coincidence, or perhaps it was fate, that had me sitting in on a class where, for a local history lesson, the teacher was presenting an article about Mrs. Town. I sat in a chair with an attached desk, along with 12 young women, while Judith, a small woman with pale skin, freckles, and bouncy red hair, stood in front of the class. Maria sat in the back row, slumped into her seat, her razor straight black hair curtaining her face as she read out loud from the page in front of her. Quote, having left high school at 14 to marry her first husband, by 1898, Elizabeth Lois Struble Town. Although no one but Maria was speaking, the room was not quiet. It was as if the hum of thoughts inside the students' minds Thoughts of what they would do when they got out of the place that day or for good were somehow audible in the form of a restless buzzing. Or maybe it was just the indifferent hum of the space heater crouching in the front corner of the room. Outside, the sidewalks were still crusted with snow and ice. But despite the weather, Maria was dressed in a short sleeved t-shirt that didn't cover the skin between the waistband of her pre-faded jeans and her navel. None of the students wore long sleeves or sweaters. I wondered if this was an issue of fashion or necessity. Probably one had been born of the other, I thought. Keep reading, Judith prompted. Maria flicked her hair out of her face, then finger combed it back to exactly where it had been. Quote, Elizabeth Struble Town was 33 and faced her life, two children, a dull marriage, and a household income that barely made ends meet with the grim cheerfulness of her Oregon pioneer forebears. Then, a spirit spoke to her. Excellent. Judith's praise was meant both as encouragement for Maria to continue and as sincere enthusiasm for her progress. Maria, who was 21 and a single mom, was just months away from aging out of the center. She had dropped out of ninth grade to work, got pregnant soon after, and now was studying for the GED while her sister looked after her five-year-old daughter. I wondered whether she noticed the similarities between herself and the subject of the article we were reading. For this day's history lesson, Judith had made a dozen photocopies of the article, Positive Thinking, New Thought Blossomed in Holyoke, which had appeared four years earlier in the local paper. Judith designed this unit on Holyoke's history to help her students better understand their city. Now, as she praised Maria and encouraged her to continue, I noticed that Judith didn't look much older than her students, though she was twice their age. Her exuberance, which seemed natural to her, also seemed a necessary trait in a setting like this. Maria and her classmates were battling hopelessness every day. Some were there reluctantly, they needed to fulfill a welfare requirement that mandated they be employed or enrolled in an education program in order to get benefits. Others had chosen to come, but still, they were frequently absent. And when they were present, they would fall asleep at their desks or feign indifference to the lessons their teachers had prepared, rather than to admit their fear of failure. Anna had warned me of all of this, 
and I could see that it would take persistent optimism of teachers like Judith to outpace the despair that seemed a more logical response to everything these students faced outside these walls. Maria continued to read, quote, town gathered her children and left, or how do you say that? Oregon, Judith said. She pointed to the state on a map in front of the classroom. It's way out there. She made the word last as she dragged her index finger across from the western edge of Massachusetts, approximating where the school was located, and then toward the Pacific Ocean. Judith seemed unfazed by the fact that this paragraph was taking over a minute to read. The words as they came out of Maria's mouth were pulled apart syllable by syllable. The next reader, Sylvie, a young woman whose eyes were ringed with heavy black liner, continued only slightly less laboriously. Meanwhile, the list of unknown or unpronounceable words continued to grow. Grim, pioneer, forebears, Oregon. I followed along with the students, staring down at the article in an attempt to model good attention skills. I kept my focus on the page in front of me rather than look out the window over the shingled rooftops of the Holyoke Range in the distance, as was the young woman to my left. Nor was I completing a find a word puzzle under my paper like the girl in front of me was now doing. <laughs> Gradually, in fact, I even became interested in the story we were reading. As the students strung together the words and sentences before them, details of Elizabethtown's life began to emerge. Although she never finished high school, had two children before she reached her 18th birthday and faced poverty, Town went on to publish Nautilus, a magazine with an international circulation. After divorcing her first husband and remarrying, she also became a leader of the New Thought Movement, a precursor to today's New Age Movement, whose followers focused on spiritual healing and positive thinking. Town was also Holyoke's first woman to hold elective office as alderman at large and the city's first female mayoral candidate and a suffragist. By now, I was reading ahead on my own, no longer paying attention to Judith or the halting efforts of the students who were taking turns plowing through yet another sentence. To me, Elizabeth Town had suddenly surpassed everyone else in the room as the most interesting character present. I broke from my determined reading, however, when Judith directed the student's attention to the photo that accompanied the article. It showed a sprawling structure made of red-pressed brick limestone with dark wooden shingles and a gambrel roof. The building was marked by a jumble of dormers, windows, and porches, and looked as if it couldn't make up its mind whether to appear official or homey. That's the care center, Maria said. Of course, I thought, silently chiding myself for having missed the obvious. Judith nodded. Yes, Elizabeth Town lived here in this very house, she said. So that's how I was introduced to Elizabeth Town and the care center all at once. And I'm just going to read you a couple of paragraphs about Mrs. Town herself. Neighbors would come to refer to the house where dandelions sprouted enthusiastically on the lawn as Mrs. O.B. Joyful's house. <laughs> a wisteria vine, roses, and the looming magnolia tree gave color to the lot, but back then, it was the lady of the house who supplied the vivid color that would long be remembered. So, that's a little bit about Mrs. Town, her house, and how I found both of them. These are some of the students who um, were at the center at the time that the events in the book take place. And they're smiling, which they never did for me. <laughs> <laughs> so Mrs. Town's story is inseparable from the story of the house. And Mrs. O.B. Joyful was indeed um, almost pathologically optimistic, as my students um, accused me of being. They call me the happy teacher, and why are you always smiling, miss? Um, and Mrs. Town chronicled 
the building of the house, all the improvements of the house, well, the improvements. She, she was creating it to be her home and her office for the novelist, which kept growing and growing. Her publishing business, her magazine, just growing, 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 becoming more and more popular. I call her the Oprah of her day, but then again, I'm in love with her. <laughs> and um, then in 1910, just as she announced to her readers, 90,000 at the peak, 90,000 readers internationally. Um, just as she announced to them that they finished it, it was beautiful, the house is just how they wanted it burnt to the ground. Wow. And she used the experience of rebuilding the house to prove how her new thought beliefs of optimism and spiritual healing could literally help one rise from the ashes better than before. She was inspired and affirmed by Oliver Wendell Holmes' poem. I'm the poetry teacher, don't forget, okay? So she was affirmed by this poem that was written in 1898, just as, um, I think it was published in 1898, which is the year that the house was built. Well, according to Wikipedia, anyway, and we know how that all goes. But the chambered nautilus um, in the poem um, represents growth. It represents a sea creature who has to keep adding to its home as it grows and then finally has to abandon its shell when it grows as far as it can on this earthly plane and rises to a heavenly plane. So that's why Mrs. Town named her journal The Nautilus. And her journal was published from 1898 to, um, through the 1950s. And we named our journal, this is the story that my book chronicles, is the story of how we, my, my students and I started this poetry journal that we called Nautilus II. And together we actually researched Mrs. Town um, and, and her um, journal. We found old copies of the journal, it wasn't easy. Holyoke had not preserved the story, we had to dig it up. Um, so those are some copies of the Nautilus. Um, this is our 10th edition, and we're, our Nautilus editorial board starts Monday to make our 11th. It's a three or four month process to create each journal. And um, this was, our work was honored by the White House in November 1911, I'm very proud to say. A couple of our students got to meet Michelle Obama. It's <laughs> really quite awesome. So this is the last stanza from that poem which Mrs. Town quoted um, on the masthead of her Nautilus. Build thee more stately mansions, O my soul, as the swift seasons roll. Leave thy low vaulted past, let each new temple nobler than the last. Shut thee from heaven with a dome more vast, till thou at length art free, leaving thine outgrown grown shell by life's unresting sea. Mm -hmm. So, spoiler alert, <coughs> uh, my book ends with me being totally obsessed with Mrs. Town. I'm going on my lunch break to research her. I'm buying everything I can off of eBay that she's ever touched. And I'm taking my dog on these meandering walks through Holyoke, knocking on doors like, did you know the town? <laughs> so as the story in the book that I tell goes, it occurred to me at one point, well, first I learned just to feed my obsession that in the cornerstone of the house when Mrs. Town rebuilt it, I found this article from an old transfer telegram, that they put a time capsule in there. <coughs> so I'm obsessed with this. And I'm like harassing the landlord, like, can we open it? Can we open it? What would it take to open it? And he's just like, crazy lady, go away. So finally I decided he's right. I should stop bugging him. I should stop obsessing on Mrs. Town. I need to get to know my students. So the book ends with this lovely passage about how I decide, you know, enough with the, you know, enough with the cornerstone, enough with the time capsule. I'm going to get to know my girls, which I did. But then, um, then I left the care center. I thought I'm done here. I'm going to go get a high-paying job, get on with my life. But this is town would have none of that. Um, the economy crashed. I lost my job. Care center was like, hey, we could use your back. Somebody needs to come back from maternity leave. So I ended up back there. And the story continued. So I started harassing the landlord again. <laughs> and he tried 
tried to put me off, said, so when did they put in that time capsule? I said, 1911. He said, this was 2010. He said, come back next year, maybe we can talk. Well, Mrs. Ralph with the hat, true to his word, because of course I can forget. In 2011, I came back, and in May, my students and I opened the time capsule. And Ralph, our landlord, was a total man. She was amazing. He helped us. He got stone masons. And, um, it was a beautiful event. We lifted this box out of the cornerstone. We opened it up. We found over 122 pristinely preserved bits of ephemera. Inside, uh, Mrs. Town basically told the story of this house. The house was so symbolic to her. It was so meaningful to her. So she chronicles the birth of the Nautilus. Every house that, um, an apartment that she um, put it together in. And um, that's one of my students giving me a hug. She said, Miss, this is very exciting for us, but it's really exciting for you. <laughs> <laughs> She chronicled the fire itself. Um, she put in pictures of everybody who lived in the house, lots of herself. She was not a shy or um, self-deprecating type woman. This is her husband, William Town, standing next to her and his mother on the other side. Um, they lived in the house with a couple of servants, cook, a driver. And these are the young women who were Mrs. Town's secretaries, but she also saw them um, as her students, she was always trying to help them better themselves and move on. These were young women often from Holyoke High School, um, young women who hadn't yet married, who didn't have a career yet, and she was trying to help them make a better future. Uh oh, restart later, please. She was trying to help them make a better future for themselves. She had copies of every Nautilus up until 1911, uh, including the cover for the one that was about to come out in May. Um, when she sealed it up. She, she put in her all, all the publications that she made, including her book about her own self-healing process through spirituality, and very emotionally, um, the letter that she wrote to the future and put in the time capsule, which said basically that she hoped this house would always be a school for efficiency and self-growth, <laughs> which it continues to be today. Um, and I'm proud to be part of it, still teaching poetry there, and still being taught and learning from new groups of poets. And we do our reading every year at the Odyssey Bookshop. We've done readings at Holyoke Community College. And um, I'm out of time, so when it comes to question and answers, if you'd be so kind as to ask me to read one of the poems from the book that the students wrote, I'll feel free.